Shabbat Shalom to all of you and welcome to our Shabbat uh, sermon and uh, today it's a special Shabbat since we are going to celebrate also an event with, uh, with the Orphan Shabbat uh, tonight at 8 o'clock uh, p.m. Israeli time we'll celebrate and uh, we join uh, the family of Atikva uh, families with the Orphan Shabbat event. And it will be a prayer from Zion event with prayers. And uh, also as a local community, we're going to worship together here. And uh, we are going to listen to a sermon specifically prepared for the uh, event for the Orphan Shabbat today. And also, we'll have the chance to support Orphan Shabbat uh, initiative mm -hmm. that supports orphans in Israel and all over the world. And also um, families which are taking care of the orphans. So it's a really great um, opportunity to join the family and uh, to support this event. Please join us and uh, get all, all the information through our website and social media. And today we are going to study together the Bayera Torah portion. As we listen to the new sermon Rabbi Arel has been prepared for us, we will also have the chance to pray for those of you who haven't uh, received Yeshua Hamashiach as your Savior, as your healer, as the Lord of your life, we'll pray together at the end of the sermon. So let's start in prayer. Avinu Malkenu, Abba Father, we come before your throne to ask you for forgiveness of all of our sins. Might be a word we said or action we did and thought we had in our mind that is not allowed is not, is not aligned to your will, Abba Father. We ask you for forgiveness. Please give us the chance to learn from our mistakes and always come to your throne to ask you for deliverance from our past, deliverance from our sins, and learn from you. Learn from you, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Learn what's the path that leads to you, Mashiach, and to you, Hashem. Amen. And this we pray in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Amen. And now we're going to invite uh, Rabbi Arel to uh, share with us the Torah for today uh, with the Torah portion by Yera. Amen. Thank you, Rebetzin, Gabriela. And uh, I want to thank you all for joining us today. I really love spending time with you, even if we can't be in person and in, in, uh, uh, seeing each other in person. But we want to just know that, that we love all of you who are listening. And if you need prayer or have any prayer requests, just contact us. We will pray for you. And maybe if you want to pray in person, we can set up a time on Zoom or Skype, whatever you want. Uh, so just let us know. Uh, today is, uh, <coughs> the Rebbe Tzim Gabriel said, today is the uh, Vayera portion, which means, and he appeared. The Torah portion comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse, uh, uh, chapter 18, verse 1, sorry, through 22, verse 24. <coughs> the Haftarah, the prophetic portion comes from 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 37. And for the Brit Kadashah, which is the New Covenant, New Testament, comes from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 40, and 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 11. So, uh, <coughs> excuse me. In Parashah Bayera, Abraham's nephew Lot is rescued by angels from the city, sinful city of Sodom. And today we are talking about Sodom. And is it a city of justice? 
And what was the real sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? So, uh, after he, uh, Lot is rescued by angels from the sinful city of Sodom, and after he and most of his family escape, the city is destroyed by heavenly fire. Uh, <clears throat> if you go to that area of Israel nowadays, you will see there are huge uh, rocks and boulders of sulfur that have rained down at that time. They're still there, and there's nothing left of the city. Okay, so there seem to be the main plot points of the story, and yet upon a closer inspection, there actually seems to be a larger story maybe being told, one that might make us question what we know about the real sin of Sodom, obviously, <clears throat> besides what we know, something else. So woven into the story of the destruction of Sodom are a, a variety of subtle references to a different story in the Bible, uh, of all things also the Garden of Eden. So what do these two stories have to do with each other? Is there any common theme or lesson that runs through both of these stories? So in this sermon, we're going to explore the connection between the stories and suggest that Sodom may not have been the lawless place we usually envision in writing, but more deeply Sodom may have held in itself a secret of how one can truly follow Hashem's path. <clears throat> Just bear with me, this is going to be pretty interesting. And in the construction of an ideal society, unfortunately failed in its choice of life and customs before Hashem, uh, <clears throat> and just before he destroyed it. Okay, so what do these two stories have to do with each other? Is there some common theme or lesson that runs through them both? So, we're going to explore the links between the stories and suggest that Sodom might not have been the lawless place we usually imagine, or at least in their eyes. Instead, it had a different problem in understanding it holds the secret of how one can truly follow the path of Hashem or God in building an ideal society. <clears throat> so my name is uh, Rabbi Harel Clint Fry. I want to welcome you to the Parasha Vayera. This week's parasha contains a solution to a very great mystery, a puzzle whose origins take us back to the Garden of Eden itself, as I said. So what are the biblical connections to Sodom's sin in Eden? So as Adam and Eve were, walked, were being banished from Eden, the verse tells us that God uh, put some special agents, angels, agents, not really, but some special angels at the entrance of the garden. They were there to stand guard. But the cherubs weren't just there to guard the garden in general. Their interest was in a very particular part of the garden, as you know. Lish mores ederech eitz hachayim, to guard the path to the tree of life, right? <clears throat> like nobody could get to the tree of life again. So not only does the Garden of Eden contain a mysterious tree of life, but we learn in this verse it also apparently contains a pathway to that tree. So what is the meaning of this pathway? Was it a yellow brick road like in the Wizard of Oz or something like that? A gravel path, maybe with a nice little sign that says this way to the Tree of Life? We don't know. We weren't there. I imagine it was just beautiful. <clears throat> a path seems like a way of gaining access to the thing that lies at the end, as we know. If you uh, climb a pathway in the mountains and you're hiking, you know that eventually that pathway is going to lead you to a specific place, probably the top of the mountain or to a very beautiful spot somewhere nearby, all right? So, the mystery, so there's the mystery of how to access the tree of life. Does it somehow lie in this path? So, in this parasha, Vaira, it seems to illuminate the nature of this so-called elusive pathway. <clears throat> so, see how I want to get back to Edom for a minute, back to that verse we just looked at, the passage that describes mankind's banishment from the garden, and play that favorite game of mine. Where else do we hear these words? So, in the ways it's going to work is we're going to look at these banishment, banishment from Eden verses, and we're going to highlight eight particular uh, peculiarities in this text. So, ask yourself as we go through this, where else in the Bible do we meet a story that contains all eight of these same elements? So, here we go. We're going to talk about sending a hand and sending a person. So, Biomer Hashem Elohim Hin Ho Odom Hoyo Keachad Mimenu Lo Da Astov Boro Peato 
פניש לך יודו ולא כך גם מעץ החיים ויאכל בו חי לעולם. And the Lord God said, now mankind has become like one of us, notice the one of us, knowing good and bad. And now perhaps he will stretch out his hand and also take also from the tree of life and eat forever, and, or eat and live forever. So right here is the first element. Let's pay attention to it. The word shalach, paired with the word yad, which is a hand, stretching out of a person's hand in order to grab something. So here's the next element. Back in our verses, we've got next. By shalech hu Hashem Elohim migadein la abod. Esho adomo asher lukach mishom. Okay, so the Lord God sent him from the Garden of Eden to work the land from which he was taken. So someone is being sent out of the place they're living, and this is the second element. <clears throat> Now we're talking about the garden. The next element adds more specificity to the place where the person is being sent from. In our original story, that place, Migadin, uh, Migan Eden, from the Garden of Eden. Okay, Gan is garden. And in the other story, we're thinking about the place from which someone is sent happens to be a garden too. Okay, that's element number three, is a garden. Next in, in, in Eden story, we arrive at the verse we talked about just a minute ago. Vaigoresh ishodom vayashkin mikedem vegan eden ishakkeruvim. Sorry. He drove the man out and stationed east of the Garden of Eden, these angels called cherubs, east of the Garden. And the other story we're thinking about, guess what? We also meet some angels, right? So element number four is angels. So back in Eden, just where were these angels? The first says that they were stationed Mikedim Legan Eden. Well, in the other story, I'm thinking about we also have the same direction. Mikedim, from the east. Okay, the word Mikedim means from the east. So that's element number five. Now, if we go back to our Eden story, these angels in the east, east of the garden, it turns out they were holding something, a flaming sword, <coughs> special divine fire. Well, the story I'm also thinking about has special divine fire in it too, if you think about it. So here's the element number six, divine flames or divine fire. So here we are back at Eden, the flaming sword the angels were holding, <coughs> the Torah tells us something interesting and unusual about it. The sword was mit hapechet which the word literally means turned over or reversed. The sword seems to have been turning around somehow. All right, maybe it was twirling in the air. We don't know. It just so happens that this word meet, meet hapechet that shows up in the other story, that story too is about something that gets turned around or turned over or reversed. <clears throat> so here's element number seven, meet hapechet. So I'm going to hold back for a minute on the promised eighth element, and but we've got enough here to go on uh, for, the, for the moment. So let's get to the uh, $100,000 question. What other story has all these elements? <clears throat> shalach Yad, sending out your hand to grab something, followed by just Shalach, sending someone out of their home, the word Mikadem, which is to the east, a garden, angels, fire, and Mitapechet. All right. What other story has got not just some of the elements, but all of the same elements? So we're, now we're going to talk about the parallels to Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible. So the other story is, like I said, the destruction of Sodom. Okay. So yes, we'll have all eight elements. So we're sending out a hand to grab something. That's the angels. They're in Sodom with Lot, and the mob approaches them. The mob is seeking to molest the guests that Lot has brought into his house. They want to have the relations with them, have sex, however you want to put it. At that moment, the angels send out their hand and grab Lot, and they save his life. Okay. Right after this, Lot gets sent from the city. Okay. Vayitzkor Elohim is Avraham by Shalach. Es lot mitoch ha ha 
Fejo. God remembers Abraham and sends Lot from this destruction. <clears throat> so what about the garden? Well, back when Lot first settled in Sodom, the Torah just happens to mention that Sodom was Kegan Hashem, like the Garden of Eden itself. It was a very lush and fertile area with a river running through it. If you think about it, it's right there in the Jordan Valley, right near the, the, the Jordan River. So Mikadim, yes, to the east. When Lot chooses to settle in Sodom in the first place, we hear, by Lot Mikadim, Lot travels from the east. So next element are the angels. Of course, the angels come to destroy Sodom. First time, they weren't there to destroy the, the garden. They were just there to guard it. Okay. So, in the special divine fire, yes, Sodom has plenty of that. It is destroyed through divine fire raining down from heaven. Okay. So, what verb does the Torah use to describe this destruction? Well, if you guessed it, the same verb as the rotating sword back in Eden, mit apechet. All right, it says, Vaishalach es lot mitok haha pecho. And Lot was sent out from that destruction. From the word, but the word for destruction is hapecha, <coughs> literally means turn overness. Okay, in Hebrew. So here's some clues to unravel the meaning of Sodom's sin. So, so far we've seen seven parallel elements. We'll get to the eighth here in just a moment, but I just want to stop here for a moment and ask you what, what you think the meaning uh, is of that which we've seen so far. It certainly seems like the story of Adam's banishment from Eden is, Eden is getting paralleled in a kind of weird way uh, by this week's story of the destruction of Sodom. But now I want to ask why the Torah would do this. <clears throat> what are we meant to learn from it? It's a good question. So let's take a guess. Broadly speaking, how would you say we might summarize the similarity between these two stories? Well, both stories, we're looking at the loss of a garden. The first is a divine garden, God's special place on earth. The second is a more kind of normal, mundane, everyday place, the fertile plain in the Jordan Valley, the place where Sodom was located as a <clears throat> paradisiacal, lush setting perfect for growing wonderful crops. And if you go there now, you wouldn't be able to grow anything. It's too salty, the air's salty and very humid. But at that time, it wasn't so. In each story, the inhabitants co commit some sort of sin and lose access to their garden. Okay, so that's the basic similarities between the stories. Beyond that, there are some important contrasts also between the two stories. So in the first story, Eden, at, in Eden, Adam and Eve, they lose access to the garden. But neither they nor the garden are destroyed. <clears throat> in the Sodom story, you know, God does go a bit further. Both the inhabitants and the garden are just completely destroyed. Nothing is left standing. You can't even recognize the place if you go there. So it seems that we are looking at a kind of progression here. The eating of the forbidden fruit, that was the first step along a dark and dangerous path. A path whose possible end state could be Sodom. So in other words, if people don't uh, disabuse themselves of the evil values they express by reaching for that fruit, they risk the possibility that sometime in the future, these evil values will give rise to an entire society that institutionalizes these values. If that would ever happen, the society itself would need to be destroyed. This is kind of what's going on right now in the world these days, especially in America and uh, starting from California, and other states where evil is being legalized, okay, Oregon uh, legalized some hard drugs, California legalizing uh, homosexuality along with many other states, and now pedophile, many other things, and it's happening in other parts of the world. We're going to see some major destruction happening, <clears throat> okay, and it's pointless to pray for these places because they've already made their decision. All you can do is do like Lot, and run. And that's what God's going to start telling people pretty soon. Get out. Because if you stay, I'm going to destroy you along with it. Like you would have done with Lot. Okay. And some of the family that decided to stay behind were destroyed. So, that's just a little sidetrack. So, what was the real sin of Sodom and Gomorrah? All right. Besides the obvious. Okay. The people of Sodom, they weren't just bad. They actually institu institutionalized evil. Okay, they built it into their system of law. 
kind of like what's happening, like I said, in the United States and other countries, Canada and other parts of the world. The mob that happened to converge on Lot's door that sought to molest his guests, the text describes him as young and old, okay? From one part of society to the other. A very interesting demographic, I would say. <clears throat> it doesn't seem like the mob was motivated just by loss, even though that was part of it. They were motiv motivated by civic duty, well, at least what they thought was civic duty. This was a mass, a civic protest on Lot's lawn because Lot broke their rules. Sounds like just what's happening in the United States. Okay, people aren't liking the fact that people are standing up for truth and they have all these uh, civic protests. But what are these protests against? They're not against evil, they're for evil, right? Exactly the same thing happening now. Sodom, it was the original gated community per se, and as other uh, uh, rabbis have written, the rules were, we keep guests out of our little paradise, our little place by raping and robbing them. Very interesting, but if you think about it, <laughs> It definitely would make it so I wouldn't want to go there. All right? The Sodomites institutionalized evil. <clears throat> so besides the fact that there was sodomy going on and other evil things, they made it their way of life. Their civil law. Just like it's happening now in these times. Ultimately, there's no place in the world for a society like this. Both the garden and the inhabitants have got to go. So it will be for all the places on earth where sin is legalized. Just think of sodomy, like I said, ped pedophilia, homosexuality, bestiality, uh, lesbian, lesbianism. These countries will disappear like Sodom, right? That's what's going to happen. It's written in the Bible. And for those of you who think that we should be going towards all these things who those of you who are happy that uh if biden uh biden whatever his name is gets elected as president or whatever finally we're going to have this inclusivity oh it's going to be so great guess what your destruction is coming it's biblical it so happened in the past it will happen again okay if you want to go against god's ways you want to celebrate these things you want to make them law you will be destroyed I'm telling this because I love you. I want you to come to Yeshua. I want you to come to Jesus and ask for forgiveness. Give up the evil ways. Not accept these evil ways as normal. So now we're going to talk about the eighth parallel between Sodom and Eden. So if the parallels we have suggested the existence of a dark path. Perhaps they also suggest the existence of another kind of path. <laughs> a good, wonderful path. This brings us straight to the eighth parallel between these two stories. <laughs> so you can see the eighth parallel if you just keep reading the Eden story. So after you read about the angels with this fire and sword that is mit hapachet, right? After that, we hear one last thing. We hear about the purpose of the angels. Lishmor es derech etz hachayim, and the fiery, ever-turning sword to guard the path to the tree of life. So the same language appears in the Sodom story, Lishmor Derech. Where is this? The path to justice and the true sin of Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be revealed. That expression appears right before God decides to destroy Sodom. That particular moment in time, God chooses to consult Abraham about the Lord's plans. <clears throat> and then in the narrative aside, God tells us why he's even bothered to consult Abraham about his plans. God says to himself, Ham chase ani me Avraham asher ani ose. Shall I really hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? So, yi yidativ leman asher yitzave esponav be esbeso acharav be shomeru derech Hashem la asos tzedoko umishpot. For I have connected with Abraham so that he may instruct his children and his progeny after him to keep the path of God 
to do what is just and what is right. So this is why he's going to let Abraham in on this whole thing. This is, there it is, Lishmor Derek in this Sodom story. Keeping or guarding the path back to the tree of life somehow gets mirrored in this Sodom by Abraham's keeping the path of God to do Zedek and Mishpat, to do the right and what is just. <clears throat> this is pretty fascinating. Earlier, back in Parashah Bereshit, which is the beginning, the very first Parashah, the Torah portion, talk to you about how the cherubs, they appear twice in the five books of Moses. Once where they guard the original tree of life, and once more when they guard the Ten Commandments. The Torah, which is interestingly enough, is described in the Proverbs as a tree of life. So, add it all up. These cherubs, they always end up guarding some sort of tree of life some way. But if the Torah is a tree of life, we see now that this tree, so to speak, comes with a path, a path you can walk on. What is this path? Lasot tzedakah umishpat. It is the path of tzedak and mishpat. The right thing to do and the just thing to do. <clears throat> so, the just thing to do and the right thing to do. This is pretty interesting, pretty fascinating. We often think that these two are synonyms, that they kind of mean the same thing, but not necessarily. I want to suggest they are actually not the same thing at all. They're actually maybe in tension with each other. Okay. So there are two values, two building blocks of a virtuous society. Both values are extremely crucial. Zedek and Mishpat. And the tension between them defines exactly what kind of a society we're really going to have. <clears throat> so let's imagine the perfect society and ask yourself, why is it good to live here? Invariably, you will find yourself giving it an answer. You will take, that will take you back to Zedek and Mishpat and the balance between these two. So the first value is, is justice. Society is fair. Everyone gets a fair shake, a fair deal. There's a level playing field, and therefore there's an opportunity for all. Cheaters are not tolerated. Justice is supreme and it reigns. That is mishpat, that word in Hebrew for justice. But rules alone don't make this a good society. You have to do something else too, right? So here's the second value, the right thing to do, tzedek. Someone is down on their luck. They're having a hard time. In fact, if you go to Jerusalem, you see beggars, and they're on the street calling Zedek, Zedek. <laughs> they're basically saying, do the right thing. Help me out. <laughs> so <clears throat> they're homeless, maybe. He's not the, it's not the fair thing to do for me to reach out and to help him. That's what we need to do. That would be the fair thing to do, the right thing. Maybe. Or is it the right thing to do? To care for the less fortunate to alleviate suffering when we can, to brighten the days of the others. This is tzedek, the right thing to do, regardless of whether it happens to be fair, right? So many people will see a homeless person asking for money and say, go get a job. I think, not in all cases, many people just love to beg because they actually make more money doing so. That's where I would say it might not be fair or even right to give that person money because you're just helping them to stay in that situation. <clears throat> You're enabling them, and that is a sin. However, there are those who truly want to find a job, who wish they could find a job, who had a job, maybe lost it because of unfortunate circumstances. Okay, but maybe they just can't. Who's gonna hire a person who's dressed in a certain way, who's dirty and un unkit? Obviously, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. That's where it'd be right and fair to reach out and help the person. Okay. So every society must balance these prime values, Zedek and Mishpat. So what is the biblical lesson between the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah? Sodom did have justice in its own sense. It created its own sense of rules, but those rules didn't express care and regard for the others, for other people. So the society was devoid of Zedek, of doing what's right. Therefore, it was doomed, oh, besides the fact of sexual immorality, okay? And obviously, Gomorrah had its problems too. <laughs> so God tells Abraham that this nation, the one he's going to create in order to be successful, is going to have to balance these two values, 
To attempt to create a society, a society like this is ultimately to walk in the path of the tree of life, in a way. <clears throat> At some level, the Torah is God's basic statement to man about these two values, Zedek and Mishpat. But the path to that tree seems to be our dynamic conversation with God about these values. Okay, God gave us the Torah, expressing Zedek and Mishpat. We can study the Torah. We can wrestle with its meaning, whatever, try to bring some sort of balance between the two into our personal and communal lives so that we can do and express our lives in Sedek and Mishpat. When we do that, we too walk the path to the tree of life in a way. However, we know that nothing we do on this earth, no matter how good we try to do in Sedek and Mishpat, we're never going to reach righteousness. And it says so, okay, in the Bible, in the but had a shah, the new covenant. <clears throat> As Messianic Jews, we know that Yeshua, the Messiah, Mashiach himself, the Messiah, is the Torah of truth, the tree of life of the new Jerusalem. And this is also written in the book of Ezra, chapter 2, verse 12, chapter 8, verse 52. In Second Ezra, which unfortunately has been taken out of some of the Bibles by uh, whatever the so called church is found in 2nd Esdras 2, 12 and 8, 52 also. John chapter 3, verse 14 and uh, verse 15 also. And Revelation 22. That one way we will join him in all of his thunder and be in his presence in the new Jerusalem in the garden that was initially promised to us and at the end of time will be given back to us through him by grace. Okay, there will be the tree of life which is Yeshua. And there will actually be a real tree with fruit. Okay. We can all have access to that path to the tree of life, that conversation and personal relationship with Hashem, with God that leads us to redemption when we accept Yeshua as our Mashiach, as our Messiah, as our Savior in our heart. That's the only way. There's no other way. You can do all the tzaddik, the right acts you want to do. You can have all the laws you want to do, all the justice, <clears throat> so-called. You are a sinner. We are all sinners. There is no salvation except through Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. That's it. It says so. If you don't read the Brit HaShah because you say, well, that's evil, and, and that's written by this and that, guess what? All the authors are Jews. Jews who have recognized Yeshua as Mashiach, as the Messiah. It's all there. Okay. I dare you to read it. I invite you to read it. Whatever is the right word for you. If you have the courage to read something, which is you've been told is not good to read, because it was written by whoever, Gentiles, whatever, this or that. You're wrong. And whoever's telling you this is telling you evil. You have the choice yourself to read what you want to read and decide for yourself what you want to believe. You are not to be told by a rabbi or anybody else what to believe. You have the choice to believe what you want to believe or not believe. If you're going to give somebody else that choice, <clears throat> then you're not exercising that which God gave you, and that is free will. Okay, and I know you recognize that. So, we accept Yeshua as our Mashiach in our heart, as our Savior and Lord of life. So we ask you to please pray with us for those who have not yet received the Mashiach, the Messiah, in their heart. It's extremely important. It's the, me it's the only thing left. And as I said before, time is short. We do not have a lot of time left. We have a few years. Ten, eight, we don't know. But that's not that long before Yeshua comes back. And there will be a certain point when it's too late to decide. First of all, when you're dead. Second of all, when he comes back. That's it. You will not have that chance again. Now is your time. You do not know if you have tomorrow. Or even an hour from now. Once you are gone, it's too late. You will go to hell. You will spend your life, eternal life, it will never end, in suffering 
away from the presence of, Hash, of Hashem, of God. Or you can choose life, the tree of life, which is Yeshua. He loved us so much, he chose. He chose to be sacrificed for us, for our sins. He could have said, no, I'm not going to do it. The Father, Abba, he loved us so much, he sent his son, Yeshua, to die for us because he wanted to give us a way to salvation. But it's the only way. So I want to invite you now to pray with us a prayer of salvation, which I will be inviting the Rebbe Tzingavrela to lead us in. So thank you for joining me today. Shabbat Shalom. So that about Rabbi Arel for uh, this very beautiful sermon we have discovered in the deepest part of the scripture how important it is to be connected to Hashem and establish a personal relationship with him through the path that leads leads to the tree of life that as we said is the Torah of truth it's Yeshua HaMashiach Jesus the Messiah and we want to pray the blessing of the Messiah the salvation prayer for all of you who haven't uh, yet received Yeshua Mashiach the Messiah of Israel in your heart as your Savior and your Lord, the Lord of your life. So let's pray together. And if you have already received uh, the Mashiach Yeshua as your Savior and Lord of your life, please join us in prayer. So you might pray for your family, your misprecot, your congregations, uh, members which are not yet in Yeshua and also family and friends, relatives, whoever is on your path might be blessed through this prayer, through your prayer. Amen. So let's pray together. Baruch Ata Adonai Elohenu Melecha Olam Asher Nathan Lanu Ederek A Yeshua Pemeshiak Yeshua. All together in English. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation in Messiah Yeshua. Amen. And if you have prayed this prayer with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might, please contact us. We have a, a beautiful gift for you. As a Jew, you are going to discover the path that leads to the tree of life, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, who is the only way to receive redemption that's what you're waiting for from a long time so we pray hashem shall lead you all to the path that leads to the tree of life yeshua hamashiach jesus the messiah and uh, please contact us through the social media via email uh through our website there are many ways you can do it and now I'm going to invite Rabbi Arel to pray for us the ironic blessing. Thank you, Rebbe Tzin Gabriela, for this beautiful prayer. And now I want to just pray the uh, blessing over you as we close. Those of you, even if you're not decided yet, if you want to receive Yeshua as Mashiach, as your Savior, if you're a Jew, we will give you this book for free. You can read it for yourself. Like I said, it's up to you what you want to believe. You have the right to decide. But if you do not look, if you do not look into this, if you do not read for yourself, you cannot make a decision. Like I said, don't let others decide for you. You decide for yourself. We will send this to you for free. It is without cost if you are a Jew. Uh, it is a, a, a free gift. So thank you for joining us today. Yevarechecha Dunai Vishmarecha. 
יאיר אדוני פניו אליך ויחוניך, יישא אדוני פניו אליך וישים לך שלום, בשם ישוע המשיח, שרה שלום שלום. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, Shalom. Thank you for joining us today. Shabbat Shalom to all of you.